They're dedicated police officers who investigate our most serious crimes. I remember having nightmares about the scene. They would be the most evil people I've ever dealt with. Over the next three weeks, we see through the eyes of detectives from the New Zealand Police Criminal Investigation Branch. It was a real kind of whodunit scenario. This was about business and making money. These are the untold stories behind New Zealand's worst cases and the hunt for those who done it. There's always a trail, and we've just got to find that trail and then put that before the courts. The detectives of the New Zealand Criminal Investigation Branch deal in serious crime, and crime doesn't come more serious than murder. Tonight, we get the inside story on critical cases that show how detectives use dedication, community support, and detailed forensic work to solve a homicide. Certainly a lot of the homicides we have are domestic-related. I've never met an offender yet that really wants to be caught, and they will go to long lengths uh, to avoid being caught and held accountable. So that's the whole crux of an investigation. You just want to find out the truth. Ladies and gentlemen, Jim Vanna. Statistics show that around half the homicides in New Zealand are committed by someone close to the victim. But our worst nightmare is a terrifying random attack from a total stranger in our own home. This family in a normal street in a normal suburb were sitting down on their lounge suite watching the eight o'clock lotto drawer. And just after eight, the outside light was on and they heard a knock on the door. The mother went to the door, opened the door, and there was a six foot three man with camo paint on his face wearing camo gear. The husband came running out. The husband died at the scene and then the offender went in and, and had another go at mum and managed to axe her in the back and in other places around her body. The daughter managed to unlock the back door and run out of the house across the street to a neighbour and he left the mother wounded in the address and then ran out the door to chase the daughter across the road. Within the two hours, we'd cordoned the area and they managed to locate him hiding the school grounds. Catching the killer was a relief, but Catherine's team knew the forensic examination was critical for building their case. Luminol sprays showed bloody footprints up and down the street. We had to turn all the street lights off because you've got to have pitch black and we had a big tarp over our heads and we were spraying the substance and then had to take photos. We had to spray because it only reveals for a short period of time. Then photograph the footprints. And we basically tracked them a mile down the street. Even when a case looks simple, the evidence has to back up the crime story. The defence argued that this was a frenzied attack and he'd temporarily lost his mind and he'd just done it and then taken off. And we could actually prove that, no, he hadn't. He'd actually gone into every room in the house. He'd actually walked around the scene a number of the times and that he actually had a crack at each person on more than one occasion. For example, on the table, he'd attacked her in the back when she was spread across the table. So she had blood on her hands as well. So she'd grabbed the table so we could find fingerprints on the table. But you also see the pattern where he'd hit her. And I think it was a diagonal across the back where the blood had splattered from the weapon across to the far wall. So a detailed scene examination can prove um, that offender's account is wrong. And that's what it did in this case. When he was asked later on why he'd gone to that particular house, and I mean, there was nothing special about this house in the street. They were, you know, very similar homes. He'd said the light was on, and he'd gone there because the light was on. Catherine and the other detectives spent days surrounded by the horrors of the crime scene. The brutality was plain to see. There was blood everywhere, and of course, the smell gets to you after a while because, um, you know, Every day you're in there, uh, the evidence is older and it smells more and, uh, yeah, it's not pleasant. But you know why you're there. You're there to get the bad guy. 
Killer Ronald Krynan was sentenced to a minimum 12 and a half years in prison, but the scene has stayed with Catherine McCavity forever. I remember for months and months I used to have this dream where I'd take people into this house and I, in, in the dream I was a real estate agent and I would be stepping around the blood going, don't mind the blood, but here's the kitchen and here's the lounge and I, could, I kept seeing the floor and the walls and, and I could just visualise it all the time in my dreams. And I didn't wake up upset or anything, but I just got sick of having this dream with all this blood. I couldn't get the blood out of my head. Random killings are very rare. In most homicides, there's a connection between the victim and the offender, and it's just finding what that connection is. The scene at a South Auckland factory facing Mark Guthrie and his team was horrific. Police say a knife attack is the likely cause of death for this 58-year-old man. Two flatmates found his body wrapped in bedding stuffed in the boot of a white car around 9 o'clock last night. The victim lived in and ran a light engineering business from this Manuko warehouse. In Ray Mullen's upstairs flat, there was graffiti on the walls and blood everywhere but a thorough detective always looks for that link between victim and suspect. Been a number of weapons used. There was knives, there was hammers, there was one of the legs off the bed, there was an ashtray. So it had been a significant attack. And afterwards, they tied him up, even though he was dead, and dragged him down the stairs and put him into the boot of this car. Ray Mullins um, had a propensity for young girls. He, he used to visit uh, young street prostitutes. Um, so what was written on the walls were things around that. There was Kid Fucker BFL 1999, which stands for Blood for Life. Uh, Bloods are a, a youth street gang. So a number of things. Uh, most of it was to try and put us onto the wrong trail. But what, in effect, it did do why that whole cover-up was um, a good scene examination actually gave us all the evidence to solve that crime. We found palm prints on the wall right next to where they'd been painting on the wall and obviously they'd been standing there hand on the wall painting. They'd used a glass ashtray so there was fingerprints in blood on that ashtray. But more damning than the fingerprints was a footprint found in blood next to the body in the car boot. The footprint is identifiable and unique, as is your fingerprints. So that certainly gave us a line of inquiry um, that we followed that and uh, were able to identify whose foot that was that had put that in the blood there. So we went and identified these young girls that he had the connections with and spoke to them, started to build a picture of these people. While we did that, we would take their footprints uh, to compare them. and. We just worked our way through all these all these girls until we got to the right group. And this killing had been committed by three girls. 15-year-old Natalie Fenton, her 20-year-old sister Katrina on the right here, and 18-year-old Daniela Bowman on the left. The reason they were there was they thought he had a lot of cash in the place and that's what they were looking for. And they had stolen a lot of items from, from the house um, or the flat when they committed this murder and we found all those items at their house. The clues found by detectives in their search of the flat and factory saw all three girls given life sentences for murder. But searching an entire city for pieces of a puzzle is a much tougher prospect. What started as a simple missing person inquiry quickly became a whodunit homicide that saw detectives literally piecing together a jigsaw puzzle of clues from all over Auckland and across the Tasman. Alan Boreham was on call the night Graham Kirkwood went missing. I got a call 1am Saturday morning uh, to say that um, we had a missing person case and they had grave concerns for the safety of Graham Kirkwood. His partner had come home quite late there were clearly signs of a struggle in the house. Quite a lot of things had been knocked over. There was blood. And far more chilling, there was a note saying that they would call her and that she was not to call the police. Within about 12 or 14 hours, a body was recovered in Mungaree. 
Police say the man in his mid-40s died from multiple head injuries and stab wounds. They suspect his body may have been dumped at the scene. In the middle of a grassy area was the body of Graham Kirkwood. So it changed very quickly over that weekend from a missing person case to a homicide. The most obvious thing that was missing was his gold BMW. Um, he was quite a successful businessman and had a large uh, BMW estate car. That was gone. OK, uh, John Thackeray is working through the forensics. Once we'd found Graham, once uh, we had his uh, body, we believed that the key to the inquiry would actually be based around the car. And that really became the focus of the inquiry. We thought if we can locate that car, that will give us our next chance at identifying who these offenders are. We had a whole range of sightings. A lot of people said that on or around the weekend of the killing that they'd seen a gold BMW in various places. And in fact, that became quite problematic. Uh, basically, this car had been all over New Zealand on that weekend. Alan's team were looking for gold in a nationwide haystack until cut-up parts from a gold beamer started showing up around town. Investigators were finding their trail. This gave us some hope that these offenders were panicking, they were uh, worried about the media interest in the car and they were now trying to make it disappear. At the reserve in Oriel Avenue opposite West Harbour Primary School, a literal truckload of BMW parts were found in the bush. Since then, pieces of the car have been found dumped throughout West Auckland. It was scattered across all of Auckland, the car, south, east, west, uh, you name it, and within cities, out in the rural areas. The BMW parts as they were recovered were reconstructed out at the Mount Wellington police station and that was actually where we were running the homicide from so that was quite useful you'd come in each day and see the parts slowly building up and that helped with the persistence that helped uh, keep us going. A lot of people rang us to tell us about car parts that had been dumped across Auckland I mean a lot of times we would rush out with the team and get divers in or special salvage people and pull these parts of the car out of creeks or from fields or down banks and They'd be gold, but they'd turn out to be uh, not the gold car that we were looking for. And in fact, I think we recovered about half of a gold Ford Fairmont and about a third of a, a gold uh, Honda Accord as well. So clearly they weren't the only people cutting cars up and dumping them around Auckland. Detectives often say solving crime involves the whole community, and it was an eagle-eyed citizen in Coatesville who phoned in the breakthrough they were looking for. She'd spied a man illegally dumping rubbish, which turned out to be car parts. And at first, she gave a description of a car, which was a white sedan, not all that helpful, really, but certainly a start, um, and that they were dumping parts, and they'd confirmed that there were actually parts there, so we knew it was our offenders. Um, however, during the interview, she began to recollect that she'd actually recorded that registration number on a warehouse receipt because she'd had some idea that she might report them to the council uh, for dumping rubbish. Um, and uh, she went back to a car, searched a car, um, and to the great relief of the detective, actually uh, turned up this receipt, and sure enough, there was a registration number on the back of that receipt. Um, and that led us to one of the first offenders. We did a very early morning search warrant on that address, but it was only when we got in under the house and found what could be described as an Aladdin's cave of property that we realised that he was far more closely connected to the killing than we could have hoped, and there were the wheels of the BMW stacked up underneath the house. Um, and at that stage, we knew he had a lot of questions to answer. The man's name was William Zhao, and he denied any involvement in the killing. As always, detectives looked at his associates. William Zhao had a friend by the name of Bowman Pham. And what was interesting about that friend is he had since, within days of the homicide, gone to Australia. And with the assistance of the Australians, we were able to go over there and uh, get hold of him, interview him, and get some admissions from him about his involvement. One of the really helpful things we had on this case was the advances that had been made in forensics. And that was particularly around the ability to identify footprints in the house. 3D imagery revealed the final violent moments of a man's desperate fight for survival. We were able to determine that there was in fact five people involved in this killing. We could reconstruct how they had attacked him, fought with him, injured him, bound him up and then put him into the boot of his own car to take him away. The killers were communicating using pages, so detectives staked out the phone box they were using and caught a third man. 
he confessed and named the last two offenders. Detectives now knew what had happened and established the killer's link with the victim. Graham Kirkwood lived there at this address with his partner and her young 14-year-old daughter. And unbeknown to the family at the time, this young girl had moved with a group of people in which one of the offenders was in for a very short period of time. Um, and this offender had offered her a lift home and dropped her off. So he was aware of the address, uh, believed that they would be able to uh, kidnap the young daughter and get a lot of money as a result. They broke into that home. They lay in wait, hoping for the young girl to come home from school. And Graham Kirkwood, unfortunately, came home instead. I mean, despite a brave fight by him, he's the one that ended up being attacked and unfortunately killed. Three of them were convicted of murder, all of them of the, of the kidnapping and aggravated burglary, uh, and two for manslaughter, uh, which probably reflected, from our knowledge, the involvement of all the five parties. Piecing together the expensive BMW was the key to solving the murder of the Auckland businessman. But even the most random murder will leave a forensic trail that connects the killer to the victim. New Zealand detectives investigate without fear or favour. The resources needed for catching the vicious killers of a wealthy businessman are also used for solving the murder of a shadowy street worker. Marlene was a prostitute. She was a glue sniffer and had been left in a car park in Otahu. What we were given initially was that the person involved in this homicide was driving a small blue hatchback. The busy main road of Otahuhu, like many others around the country, is covered by closed-circuit cameras. Scrolling through the footage, Mark's team spotted the little blue hatchback cruising the strip and the car stopping among the street workers to pick up Marlene. And then going out into the area where she was killed, it, that was a darkened area that had no CCTV, but it started to build a picture. So what we started with was that we were looking for a, either a Ford Laser or a Mazda, the model was about the 81 to 85 model. We didn't get a registration number because it was at night and it was dark. But the one thing, the identifying thing it did have was a sunroof. So we started looking and we, first thing we did is we got a list of all Ford Lasers and Mazdas um, in that uh, model and age group. Uh, I think there was 20,000 of them on our list as that's our starting point. So police officers had to hit the streets, tracking down hatchback owners around the region and checking their cars for a sunroof. No sunroof, not involved. We actually went to one car that was registered in Otahu. We were able to put that car driving through Otahu just before the murder. It had blood in it, it had the sunroof and everything. With everything pointing towards this being the killer's car, it looked like Mark's detectives had their man. When we looked at that vehicle, it was involved in a crash uh, 20 minutes after the homicide in Onihunga, which was only a short distance away. He was actually very cooperative. He'd already been dealt with for the accident. What seemed like a hot lead turned out to be a dead end. At the end of it, he wasn't in any trouble. What he had done that night is something that happens driving through Idaho, just the fact that he had a similar car. It's not unusual in a homicide inquiry to have a line of inquiry go that way and you investigate it to the nth degree and then find that they're not involved. Mark's detectives returned to the list of blue hatchbacks and found another car registered to another man in Otahuhu. He lived about two k's away and when we went there he wasn't there and his flatmate said, oh, Yes, he does have that sort of car. So we kept following, we went to his work, he was a panel beater. Um, and it was when we got to his work that it started to get really interesting, as in his boss said, well, yes, he did have a car similar to that. Yes, it did have a sunroof. But one day, which turned out to be just after the homicide, he came to work and he ripped all the locks out and he smashed it all up and he sent it off to a wreckers yard to be destroyed. And we thought, oh, well, we've probably lost it. But we followed the inquiry, we got to the wreckers yard, and they said, look, it will have been crushed. Um, it would have been done ages ago. But they had a look around the yard, and they found the car intact. It had been missed, and it was sitting there. It had been extensively damaged, but we found our victim's blood um, and still a lot of forensic evidence to connect our victim to that vehicle. 
and when we tracked him down, um, the evidence had become quite strong and he admitted what, what had happened that night. Basically, he had picked up the prostitute, uh, taken her down to the car park for, to do business. Uh, she had started sniffing glue, uh, this is what he had told us, and he decided he changed his mind. Uh, she became aggressive to him. Um, he happened to have a knife on his dash and he said he picked it up to throw it away and accidentally stabbed her in the heart. So that was his version of events. Um, he went to court and he was convicted of manslaughter um, and, and did his time. With only a vague description of the killer's car and precious little else, Mark Gutry and his team had solved the crime in a matter of weeks. But a tenacious detective may persevere for years to get their man. We had no body. We had no eyewitnesses to the murder. Uh, we had no forensic evidence. Dave Clifford was investigating the disappearance of a young Palmerston North man, well aware he had a tough road ahead. Nicholas Pike had been hanging out with violent criminal Stephen Hudson when he vanished in 2002. It was described that Nick was Hudson's bitch and he would be at his beck and call. Around that time, there had been a newspaper article that Nick was a police informant, and that concerned us greatly. Stephen Hudson had recently been arrested for two serious assaults. He was known to be among the last people to see Nick, but refused to shed any light on where Nick was. He was most unhelpful. Uh, the only thing he would say that was there was a warrant out for Nick's arrest, which there was uh, for a minor drug dealing matter, uh, and he was laying low. And that was essentially all he would say to us. He wouldn't formally give us anything. So we went and spoke with Hudson's girlfriend. Morning. To me, she seemed to be the key to the investigation, to Nick's disappearance. This girl was from a good family. She had aligned herself with this bad criminal, and she just wanted to see what the life on the other side was like. She was visiting Hudson in prison. She was doing his bidding. She was very difficult to deal with obstructive and very unhelpful. Okay. Hudson was behind bars for the next 11 years for the earlier assaults. It seemed to me that she wouldn't uh, be loyal to him for that number, for that amount of time. So over the, uh, the intervening next three or four years, I kept uh, some loose contact with her. I'd appeal to her at various stages. I'd um, speak with her parents, trying to put pressure on that, that way. She got married, she had some children. In March 2007, on the fifth anniversary of Nick's last sighting, Dave Clifford made one more attempt to speak with Hudson's ex-girlfriend. In conjunction with that date, I made an approach to this girl again. She listened to us. Um, we gave her some letters from Mr and Mrs Pike and Nick's brother, um, a, a letter directly to her, which I'd had for uh, two years. I'd been waiting for the right time to give it to her. And really, it was an honest heartfelt plea from them that please help the police. I believe that she would come around, she had, she had the children, so she knew then what it would be like to have someone that she loved and could understand the difficulty Nick Pike's mum and dad and brother were going through. We spent an hour or so with this young lady. She told us that they were driving along the desert road early evening, five or six o'clock on the evening of the 18th of March, 2002. We're gonna make a quick stop, just up here. And they got to a side road, Hudson stopped all of a sudden, told her to get out of the car. They drove off the side road and he came back 10 minutes later, and Nick wasn't there. Where's Nick? I've left him to look after the dope plot. Get him. You look really evil. That was the last time this girl saw Nick, and that was the last time there was any f proper formal sighting of Nick. Never been seen again. Specialist police teams searched all the side roads along the desert road, but turned up nothing. If there had been a body handy, we would have, I'm sure we would have found it. 
Police believe Hudson had returned after the murder and moved the body. Then, prisoners who'd been locked up with Hudson came forward saying Hudson was bragging in prison of killing Nick. The girlfriend's story, corroborated by evidence from eight prisoners, was enough to convict Hudson at trial. You were armed, you were dealing in drugs and on the run, and you then murdered Mr Pike. The judge sentencing him to life in prison with a minimum non-parole period of 16 years. I didn't kill him Bullshit. We still haven't got Nick Pike's body back, in, and that's something that I still feel a responsibility for, and I still want to get resolved at some stage. And uh, the only way that's going to get resolved, I think now, is that um, is by Stephen Hudson telling us where Nick Pike's body is. Um, that's not going to make a lot of difference to his position, but it will certainly um, help the Pike family immensely. As far as they're concerned, that's where his grave is. So they go there and that's where they mourn him. In the end, it was the company he kept that cost Nicholas Pike his life. We all like to think we're safe from harm in our own homes, but case files prove that's not always true. Take your search warrant and go. One of the attractions of becoming a police detective is making a difference. But Sasha Haskell began to have doubts about her chosen career when a Wellington mother was violently killed. Pip M was a Cambodian refugee that had come out to escape the violence of Cambodia. So, you know, New Zealand was obviously a, a place that she decided to settle with her family. She had three children and had sort of tried to rebuild her life. It's an absolute tragedy and ironic, really, that it wasn't the violence in Cambodia that ended up ruining their lives. It was actually what was happening in New Zealand. Detectives were called after one of Pip M's children came home and found their mother dead. It was like a horror movie. It was obvious that Pip had been stabbed multiple times. Just how many, we hadn't really determined at that point because she was still clothed, but you could see there was a number of facial stabs. Um, and, you know, in areas that were particularly malicious, like um, in the eyes. In the end, we didn't actually count them all because it was just, once you got to sort of into close to 200, it just seemed like, well, we, we just don't know how many more there are. Wellington police began a homicide inquiry last night after the body of a Cambodian woman was found in her Miramar home. The mother of three is believed to have died some time yesterday afternoon. It had been broadcast in the radio stations and so on that there'd been a murder in Miramar. And a taxi driver called us and said, well, I got called to the facts. I picked up a, a woman and she wanted to go to Pororua. And on the way out to Pororua, she described what she'd been doing. So she actually had told the taxi driver all about what had happened. And in a, a strange sort of way, the, the taxi driver, obviously driving to Pororua where there's a mental health unit, thought that this woman was completely nuts and was heading back to the hospital, so that it was all fictitious. Police were alerted by ambulance staff who were called to the county. And then, of course, later, listening to the radio and that there actually had been a homicide that sort of matched up to what this woman was talking about, quickly rang the police. When police arrested the woman, they found she was Janine Ronganui, who lived right next door to Pip M. To build the case for trial, detectives began looking for property that linked Ronganui to the crime scene. One of the key things was a gold watch that Pip M had been wearing and she wore it every day. And when we did the body examination, she wasn't wearing that, so it obviously had to have gone somewhere. We did about six search warrants out at um, Cannons Creek and we went to one house um, which was an associate of Janine Ronganui, and they were very angry about the intrusion of the place in, in the house, and we described why, you know, obviously why we were there, had the search warrant, had the list of the property that we were looking for, and, you know, there was big big dramatics, you know, the, the search warrant got ripped up, and as she did that, I caught a glimpse of gold underneath the sleeve of her coat. Where did you get this from? Got it for Christmas. Bullshit! Who gave it to you? One of my mates. Was it Ronganui? And sure enough, there it was. It was a watch tell me and you're going to tell me down at the police station the person concerned was then now looking down the barrel of some pretty serious charges of being accessory to murder so 
we were able to use that to get some information out of her. And then she said, you know, Janine had given her the watch. Ronganui was convicted of murder, but on appeal, it was reduced to manslaughter on grounds of provocation. For Sasha, it was the last straw. It was really demoralising because everyone goes through the process. It's not just the defendant. I mean, it's the police, um, you know, the families. I mean, you know, not only do they suffer the trauma of actually losing um, a parent, but they have to go through the court processes, which itself is just reliving the whole thing. And then to go through an appeal, and then to hear, um, you know, that uh, in some way their mother provoked such an attack is just absolutely uh, insane in my book. Sasha left the police shortly after. Even after a successful conviction, tragic deaths can haunt the most seasoned investigators. A young boy who on Friday night had been into town and had bought a couple of items and he was returning home to his home on the other side of the Carillon Bay recreation area. And while he was cutting through Caroline Bay, he was accosted by this 15-year-old who had been sniffing glue, who had a knife. And uh, this 15-year-old saw that he was in possession of something that he thought he'd have. So he pulled the knife out and um, tried to rob um, this, this young kid. And this kid tried to run away. And he stabbed him, stabbed him to death. I remember that night being called out from home and, and I went down to Caroline Bay, and I can remember sort of coming around the edge of a bit of bush area there and seeing the body lying there. And it just looked like one of my sons. Um, my middle son um, was exactly the same build, exactly the same colourings, and he had a pair of trousers and a top, exactly the same as what he had there. And I can remember the horror of looking at it, and, and I can remember I, I breathed in, and then I used up the oxygen in that breath and I needed more oxygen, but my lungs were full. I just froze. Then I realised, no, he was at home when I left. It can't be him. So that's, that's one incident that I still remember quite vividly, uh, even though it's, what, 20 years ago? In such a dark work environment, black humour becomes a defence mechanism to shield detectives from the grim realities of the job. Two, um criminals or criminal types. They, they went to a party in John Street and uh, they were actually kicked out of the party because they were gate crashers. And they were quite annoyed about it and they decided that they would go back and scare the people in the party who'd kicked them out. So they went up to, I think it was Commercial Road, just off Great North Road, and they got a sawn-off shotgun and they were in this car and the way one of them was telling it, the survivor of the two, <laughs> that, that it was like a, a pulling and throwing with a shotgun. I'm, I want to go in the party, I'm going to use it. No, I will. No, I will. No, I will. And, and the, the shotgun went off and blew one of the guy's heads right out the window. So the other one kicked him out and then, and then um, drove away. We had a detective who was, um, he was assigned as OC exhibits. So his job was to collect exhibits. So there, there we had all over this road body parts, nose, ear, eye and so forth, teeth, jawbone. And so he went there with a yellow crayon and he was encircling all these pieces. Now the object of the exercise was that they were intending to get a, a snorkel from the fire brigade and a photographer was going to, a police photographer was going to climb to the very top and take a photograph and hopefully you could see all these, these yellow circles which would give you an indication of, of how the blast had sent the, the head all over the road. So we, we all sort of watched this and, and this photographer was um, just slowly climbing up, you know, with, the, with all his photography gear and, and he was almost to the top. And then who would have ever predicted this would happen? Out of the sky came in a whole flock of seagulls and they descended down onto the road and they were just picking up moustaches and eyes, bulls and ears. It's very grotesque, very, all these noisome objects and flew away. So all we had left was circles. And, you know, at the time... Um, I know this sounds very grotesque, but humour is, is uh, a, pr a prime requisite for police work, and everybody just laughed because it was so funny. But there wasn't much to laugh about when detectives were called to a Wainui Amata flat where a family gathering had gone horribly wrong.
When a woman was drowned in a Wainui Amata flat, the inquiry team knew they were treading difficult new ground. The suspects were all members of a large extended family group who had been caring for the victim. Janet Moses had started acting a little bit different uh, than she usually had. Family members had noticed that she was quiet, that she was saying a few comments, that they thought something's unusual. And so they had held a, a hooey about it. They'd, they'd all got together and, and had a discussion about what was going to happen. And they decided to take her um, under their care. Janet was with family at a local hotel when they'd stolen a lion statue. Now her whanau believed she was cursed. They truly believed that Janet was possessed with the makatu. The Fano decided a water cleansing was needed to exercise Janet's spirits. Water blessings themselves aren't unusual. Baptisms, baptisms you use water. But what evolved here was the water ceremony just grew absolutely out of control. The water ceremony had gone for hours and hours. I mean, she'd been held at that flat for days where they were looking after her. And the water had become so significant during the ceremony that one of the leaders of the family had actually put a hole in the floor to drain it. So when we're talking about water ceremony, this was something high end. We had various family members filling vessels, whether it be cups or anything they could get hold of. People were passing the water along a chain. Some people were holding her down. Some people were um, holding her eyes open, holding her mouth open, pouring the water, because they were trying to purge the demons out of her, purge the makatu out of her, but to get her to vomit. And family talked about, we could actually see the demons. They were in the shape of lions, and they were in her eyes, and that, that we were trying to get it. We were trying to gouge them out of her eyes. The group hysteria, it would have been quite terrifying, to be honest. You had all these people believing they were doing the right thing. They, they truly, th this group of people, this group of 40 people, loved Janet Moses. Police were called to the scene at 5 p.m., but Janet Moses actually died some eight hours earlier. One neighbour told us he heard what sounded like a haka coming from the house the night before Janet Moses died. There was very few on the inquiry team that had actually dealt or, or, or heard with in depth anything about makatu before. So we had to go to um, experts in the Māori culture and find out what is this, what do you do in relation to a blessing, and, and how far can you go? We looked at the whānau, uh, where were they from, where were their links. Maternally it was on Tainui, so we went and spoke with a kamatua from Tainui and we spoke about water blessings, we spoke about makatu. We said, you know, what is OK, what is culturally acceptable? And, and what is too far, and of course they came back and said, well, this, this is, this is way too far. The outcome of the trial was the majority of the um, family members charged were found guilty of manslaughter and got community-based sentences. It was tragic when I think about how far from your culture you can go without intending to, and it, it turned into a tragedy, but at the end of the day, I truly believe that what they thought what they were doing was right and it just got away on them. The saying goes, we always hurt the ones we love. And it's a cruel irony that so many murders are committed by relatives of the victim. The call we got in relation to Leanne Kingston was uh, her sister had gone round to the house when she didn't turn up to pick up her kids from school. Uh, and what the sister found was uh, Leanne in the bathroom. She'd been stabbed and there'd obviously been a significant attack in there and she was dead. There appears to be some sort of violent incident that has taken place. Um, obviously at this stage, until we conduct the post-mortem, we won't know exactly what the cause of death was. There were signs that she'd only just arrived home. The key was in the front door. You could see that the attack had taken place into the toilet, the door had been smashed. Uh, there were signs that, you know, maybe she's run into there and tried to lock the intruder out. Um, and there were signs that he'd forced his way into the bathroom when she was killed. We were looking at all the possibilities of 
Was this a random attack? Was this a burglar? But also you're, you're looking at people she knows and very quickly we were looking at the husband. There were, there were things there that sort of didn't quite add up. Can you explain for me how one of the neighbours have said that they saw you there today in the afternoon? I wasn't there. He reacted very calmly initially, but one of the guys was doing went to his work uh, and spoke to people there and had a look in the bins outside, and what he found was a couple of rubbish bags uh, full of bloodied towels and bits and pieces. And so it went from there. Forensically, we were able to link those to the murder. We interviewed him. He, he denied it. Are we going to find any of your DNA on Leanne? I never touched her. Okay. But with time to think on it, the estranged husband, Carrie Thurgood, then decided he had more to tell the police. He then uh, made contact with us through his lawyer, saying, look, I want to make a statement now. I want to tell you what happened. It wasn't me, it was someone else. And what he said then was that he'd received a phone call from his son uh, and that his son had confessed to him that he'd killed the mother and that the only reason he'd gone to the house that day was to clean up and cover it up for his son, but that his son had done the killing. And he also had his best mate come in and say he'd also received a phone call from the son to say he'd done the killing. We did a lot of work around that and were able to show 100% that the son was at his course, he was there all day, that he had no involvement in this homicide whatsoever. Uh, in fact, we were able to show that those phone calls were never made. They just didn't exist. As well as the fake phone calls, there was CCTV footage of Thurgood buying bleach, rubbish bags and gloves four days before the murder. And half of one of the murder weapons, a garden grubber, was found at his house. The result is the father has been convicted of the murder. Leanne was not the only victim in this case. Her son gave evidence in the murder trial. This is a real tragedy. He'd lost his mother, he's lost his father as well, who's now in prison for a long time. But also, he has to live with the fact that his father tried to blame him for the killing. Almost half the homicides in New Zealand are related to family violence. And instead of picking up bodies at the bottom of the cliff, the police are now doing everything they can to build fences at the top. If we can stop crime before it happens, that's a far better result than reacting to it and investigating it afterwards. So there's a big push on that whole preventative um, way of looking at things. New police teams have been formed to work closely with other agencies. We've set up with these family violence area teams, uh, and that's a detective sergeant, um, may have a detective and, an, and another uh, additional support, an investigator. And really their sole focus within their areas is to make sure that the family violence process is done properly, but also liaising with SIFs and the refuges and other agencies where required. Uh, to make sure that uh, action's taken where it needs to be, even at the what we would term the lower end type family violence offences, because those are the ones often that, that might generate into a homicide. Yeah, it is about trying to break that cycle, that cycle of violence. Next week, detecting the drug dealers. The largest ever seizure of dried cannabis. We had to have our listening devices within 50 yards of this house. In the war on drugs. He just stuck a drill through the back and identified just over 10 kilos of heroin. The gloves are off. It's a lot more dangerous out there now. As the stakes are raised by methamphetamine. They become very paranoid. 